All right, guys, this is going to be my official breakdown of the Takia Young shooting that happened in Westerville, Ohio, a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, by an officer who works for the Blendon Township Police Department. This occurred on August 24, 2023 at approximately 628 p.m. Uh, this is an incident where a young woman, Takia Young, was inside a Kroger grocery store shoplifting. Uh, there's video out there of her loading bottles of alcohol into her bag and walking out of the store without paying. Uh, she ran out to her vehicle and a Kroger employee chased after her, flagged down the officers and said, hey, this lady just stole a bunch of booze. You need to stop her. So the officers went and tried to stop, detain her so they could investigate this crime of theft. That is what happened on that day. One of the officers stood in front of her. She accelerated her car into the officer. He shot and killed her. Those are the facts of the case. Now, as far as my reaction to this video goes, we're going to, I don't know, I'm going to, I'm not going to try, I'm going to try not to waste too much time. I recorded a version of this a little bit ago and it was almost an hour long. We're going to try to keep it less than 30 minutes. Um, but I can tell you that when I initially heard about this case, I was immediately skeptical. You know, a person shoplifting drives towards an officer, officer shoots her. You know, we're, we're not trained to do that. We're, we're actually specifically trained not to do that. I had a, a, a training event years ago where I was at the range. Um, after we we qualified with our pistols, we had to go out in the parking lot. They gave us a simunition gun. They said, you stand here. This is the only an entry and exit point into a, a, a Walmart. Uh, you're dispatched on a call about a shoplifter. The shoplifter is driving a blue sedan. As I look forward, there's a blue sedan in the parking lot about 20 yards away pointed at me uh, at, when they said when the whistle blows, the scenario starts. They blew the whistle. The car turned on the headlights, started barreling towards me. I lifted up my gun with my sim rounds and I was like, stop, police, stop, stop, stop. They didn't stop. I got out of the way. Car drove by. They said, congratulations, you passed the training. Uh, that's what we were. That's why we were there. We were told, you know, you do not shoot at a fleeing shoplifter. You do not put yourself in the path of the vehicle and use that as an excuse to shoot somebody. That is what our training is. And when I initially heard about this incident, that was the first thing that popped into my head. And I thought this guy is going to be screwed. Um, once I saw the video, I kind of had a different take on it. And I think that's what we're going to talk about now. So I've got the video pulled up right here maybe i'm gonna get my face out of the way we're gonna go back up here and we're gonna go back to the beginning um now as i mentioned before this is her car parked in the thing sorry i can't put a cursor on it her car is parked right there in the handicapped spot with no license plates on it one of the criticisms i saw about this incident from a lot of people who aren't paying attention was saying, you know, just run her tags, follow her home, you can you can get her then. Well, if you look at this picture right here, there are no license plates on this car. Uh, she's parked in a handicapped spot with no license plates. It's my belief now after watching all of the footage that she did this intentionally, she knew she was gonna go commit a shoplifting offense. She didn't wanna be caught, so she didn't put any tags on the car. Uh, so you can't track a car by the tags if there are no tags. I also want to bring up the fact to people that License plates don't lead you to a suspect. Uh, they only tell you who the registered owner of a car is. They don't tell you who was driving that car. Um, now through, if this was like a, a murder or a rape or something like that, uh, if there were tags on this and the driver was not the suspect, would we put effort into finding out who the suspect driving that car is? Yes, we would. We would find the owner and we would put a lot of pressure on them to try to tell us who the person driving it was. Um, and we would hopefully we could get that information. But in the real world on a misdemeanor or theft offense, even if the officers had the license plate, um, it's unlikely that there would be much of an investigation that would come of this. Um, it's just not something that we have time to do. It's a low level misdemeanor crime. There was a, a vehicle. We would just list the vehicle as a uh, black Lexus. What is that? CS 1300. I can't quite tell. Um, would say it was a female black driver with hair extensions driving this Lexus, no license plate unknown. Here's your report number. See you later. Moving on. Uh, so the only opportunity you have to stop and identify this suspect is right here at scene. And that's what the officers went to do. Uh, the next criticism 
that I'm seeing from people online is that the officer went and stood in front of the car and that officers are taught not to stand in front of a car and that it's against policy and against the law to stand in front of a car um, and create an exigent circumstance so you could fire your weapon and all that other stuff. And it also fits into the narrative that I just told you about the training that I had a couple years ago. So let's look at the video here. Turn this down a little bit. So the first officer walks up to the window and starts saying, hey, you need to get out of the car. You need to get out of the car. She's sitting there. The vehicle is stopped. The vehicle is in park. And she's not listening to commands. So then the second officer walks over, stands in front of her car, is like, listen, you are being detained. You need to get out of this car so that we can identify you. You've been accused of theft. We need to do this now. She refuses to do so, then puts the car in drive, drives off, hits the officer, and it kind of we know how that goes. Um, something that I want to show people, this is something that you might not have seen. Sorry, to do this, pause this. Um, this is the security footage from outside Kroger that shows the incident uh, from a perspective that you haven't seen. And the reason I'm showing this is because a lot of people are saying that the car was in drive the entire time or that he got in front of a moving car, created an extra circumstance, had to use a firearm. Uh, this video right here shows that the vehicle was parked. It was not in drive when the officer walked in front of it. Um, so you're going to have a hard time proving that the officer um, knowingly put himself in front of a moving vehicle. Uh, so we can play this video. It's a little bit slow so there's the first officer walking up to the car you can see she's got it parked she has her foot on the brake first officer is talking to her through the passenger window here comes the second officer um, he's going to stand in front of the car watch his posture um, this is something else a lot of people are saying you know she's just a young girl an officer stood in front of the car pointed his gun at her of course she's going to be scared and and try to drive off well when he stood in front of the car he did not have his firearm out and i'll show you that again here in a minute um, but, uh, he didn't have his firearm out and the car was not in drive. Right as that other car pulls up, you can actually see a change in the taillights and then you can see a change in his body position. When you take a car from park and put it into drive, you have to pass over the neutral, the reverse and neutral. When you put a car in reverse, the white lights on the back flash really bright white and then it goes into drive if you're watching closely enough you can actually see that in this video immediately after that is when she drives into the officer when she put the car in drive is the moment that he pulled his firearm and you can see that in his posture staying in front of the car and then something changed when he drew his weapon it's because she just put the car in drive. Look how quickly after he pulls the weapon that she goes. It's almost immediately. So she put the car in drive. He pulled his firearm because she's now pointing a deadly weapon at him. Says, don't do it. Like I'm standing right in front of you. And then immediately before he can do anything else, she accelerates and actually takes him for a ride. So he was basically riding on the hood of that car when he fired his weapon. Um, I, and I, I did, I did another version where I just, I slowed it down. The thing that I want to point out here is you can actually see I, I slowed it down and I blew it up. So this is at 20% speed at 400% magnification. Look at the light. See, so go to it'll go to white in a second. Right there. She just put the vehicle in drive and then in a moment he's going to change his position there it is remember this is at 20 percent speed so this isn't at 100 percent speed it happens a lot slower so you can see he stood in front of a car that was in park she put it in drive 
he drew his weapon and that's when she sped up and hit him uh which kind of changes my perspective on what happened which leads me to believe that he stood in front of the car while it was parked she made the decision to put the car in drive drive towards him strike him he then shot and killed her um as far as i'm concerned legally speaking that makes this i i i i'm i don't like the i don't like saying a justified shooting um but i do think that legally speaking he's cleared in this shooting because the vehicle was in park when he walked up when he was standing in front of it she made a conscious decision to take it from park to drive press the gas and drove into him um there's also a lot of stuff on the internet with people saying that she was just a young girl. She was pregnant. She was scared. She didn't know what to do. If an officer stood in front of you and pointed their gun at you, you know, you would be scared too. And you to try to drive off, drive off. Um, what I have here is her criminal record. These are just the cases that she had in Franklin County. And she had a case in 2021 that I'd like to point out that she has a history of fleeing, eluding and failure to comply with officers. So when people say that she was just scared, that if, if an officer pointed a gun at you, you'd probably try to run too, yada, yada, yada. Um, I just want to kind of defeat that narrative, that this isn't her first time doing this kind of thing. And then you go through the, uh, the rest of her traffic offenses. She has 102 and a 65. Now, is speed the biggest crime in the world? No. But it does show a, a pattern of activity. Um, what's this next one? Come on, internet. Um, oh, this was a, uh, a petty theft offense last year in 2022. This one's interesting because it shows that she was, this charge was dismissed and she was put into a theft diversion program. Um, I'm sorry to say that this theft diversion program did not work and that she was still out thieving once more. Um, I guess, I guess one thing that I am prepared to kind of discuss that a lot of people have brought to my attention, excuse me, um, is they're saying that, you know, policy forbids you from standing in front of a, a moving vehicle that a shoplifter, blah, blah, blah. Um, we've already talked about how the vehicle wasn't moving. It was a stopped motor vehicle at the time that he went and stood in front of it. And a lot of people are still saying, well, that's still against policy. Uh, one of the comments that I would like to make about that is, you can actually break policy, but not break the law. So there can be something that you do at work as a police officer that goes against policy. You can be um, punished. You can be suspended. You can be fired for breaking policy. But if that goes to court, you won't necessarily be found guilty because your employer's policy is not the actual law. And one thing that I would like to point out is uh the policy of the Blendon Township Police Department. And then I'm going to show you a couple other examples as well, because I've posted some things online, some kind of questions, and I've asked police officers, you know, is it within your policy to stand in front of a parked motor vehicle that's occupied and running? And almost everybody will say, yes, we are not allowed to do that. When I ask them, send me your policy and prove it, their policy doesn't say anything like that at all. And that's kind of one of the, uh, one of the misnomers that's being put out in the public about this particular shooting. So um, here is the Blendon Township one. It says, um, when feasible, officers should take reasonable steps to move out of the path of an approaching vehicle instead of discharging their fire, firearm at that vehicle. So then the question will become, which one am I at here? Um, at what point did it become feasible for him to get out of the way? Like maybe this would even be a better view. Um, at what point does he have a duty to get out of the way of this car? Um, I would say that it's once it started to move. Shoot, it's showing the... So once the vehicle begins to move, that's when you have a duty to get out of the way. Uh, the question is going to be, was it feasible for him to move? Did he have enough warning? Um, that's going to be the question for the court. I think that the court would have a difficult time proving that he definitely had ample time to move. Um, I can also show you, where is it? Um, this is the uh, Columbus police policy. 
oops, right here. Uh, this is the policy of the Columbus Division of Police talking about um, deadly weapons. And it says point number three right now, right here. Uh, sworn personnel, not any vehicle, should avoid intentionally positioning themselves in the path of a moving vehicle. Um, sworn personnel are sworn personnel vulnerable to being struck by a moving vehicle should take evasive action. Uh, sworn personnel may fire a weapon at the driver of an occupied moving vehicle or from a movie ve moving vehicle only when there is an articulable, reasonable belief that the suspect or subject poses an immediate threat of death or serious physical harm. Um, I want to point out that every single time in that policy, it actually talks about a moving vehicle. Um, here's one from Orange County Sheriff's Department, I believe in Florida. And it says, um, shall it's up here like a bunch of stuff that yeah, members are not authorized to. And then down here, intentionally place themselves in the path of an oncoming vehicle, discharge a firearm at a moving vehicle, unless the, it's an, it's operated in a man, manner deliberately intended to strike a deputy or another person. Um, we'll go back to this right here. Not only was this a manner intended to strike somebody, but she actually did strike somebody. Uh, so there's not, I haven't seen any policy that would prevent the officer from standing in front of a parked vehicle like that. There was one person that was able to send me a policy. This is, I think this is out in Arizona. I'm not sure what department this is, but it does have a line right here, right in the middle of the screen says employees will not deliberately place themselves in the path of a moving vehicle or one capable of immediate movement. This is generally considered a tactically unsound or generally considered tactically unsound unless executed as part of a tactical extended in, to enhance safety, whatever. I can't read. Um, but so of all the people that were able to send me policies, I did find one that says that you should not position yourself in front of a vehicle that is moving or that uh, is capable of immediate movement. But regardless, that's not what his policy is. So I just want to make that point clear for everybody that's watching. Um, the vehicle was parked when the officer got in front of it. It was not in drive when the officer got in front of it. She made a conscious decision to take it from park to drive. At that moment is when the officer pulled his firearm and pointed at her, and then she drove into him. I believe that she had the intent of driving into him the moment she put the vehicle in drive, and she would have done that regardless of if he had his firearm out. I think that's going to be it as far as my breakdown of the actual incident. Um, now I want to talk about what I would do in this situation or what I think is the appropriate response from a police officer in this situation. Um, and the place I want to start from is the, the crime and how we handle this crime. Uh, you know, they, they did have reasonable suspicion and someone even say probable cause to believe that she committed a theft offense because they had a known complainant come out and, and tell them, you know, if you have a, a store employee running out and telling you that this person just stole, um, that's almost, I, I think that legally speaking, it would count as probable cause. Um, just came back from my, my, uh, my legal update training. And I'm pretty sure that's what he said. I would lean to, more to saying that that's reasonable suspicion and unreasonable suspicion is all you need to detain somebody, regardless of the fact they had a legal reason to detain this person. Um, when a call about shoplifting comes out, the way we handle it at my agency is you detain the person, you run them for warrants. They don't have any warrants or anything. You give their name and information to the, uh, to the store where the stuff was stolen. You take a report, they go down to the prop, the uh, prosecutor's office and they file charges. This is not a situation where you're going to place somebody under arrest. So that should change the way you handle this situation. Um, you know, there's, there's one thing that a lot of people are saying that is like a misnomer. And they're saying that this officer knowingly put himself in a position where he could be in danger and then he used that as an excuse to fire his weapon. Therefore it's illegal. Um, the, 
the logical thought process on that is not accurate um, because we knowingly put ourselves in dangerous situations all the time. Uh, you know, if, if, if I'm responding to a call about domestic violence, I'm walking up to that house. I am knowingly walking into a potentially dangerous, deadly situation. If person A says that person B has a firearm and just threatened to shoot me, I'm going to walk up to person B and question them. Um, I am intentionally walking up to someone that I believe might be armed and I'm going to ask them questions. There also might be a person who I see committing some kind of offense. Um, and I also see that they're armed. I'm going to approach that person. Generally speaking, I'm going to approach them at gunpoint, but I am knowingly placing myself in a dangerous situation that knowing that depending on their next move, I might be forced to use deadly force. Um, simply putting yourself in a dangerous situation and then using deadly force afterwards does not make it bad. But I will say it's probably not smart to put yourself in a dangerous life-threatening situation for a misdemeanor offense that you're not going to be arresting somebody out of. Um, we basically don't arrest people for shoplifting. We take a report, we send it to the prosecutor's office. That's the way my agency goes. I don't know if their agency is the same way, but regardless, this is a, a misdemeanor offense where even if you arrest that person and take them to jail, they're going to get in a war. They're going to be released without a bond within an hour. It's going to take you longer to do your paperwork than, than they're going to sit in jail. Um, arresting that person doesn't do the community any good. Um, it, it just doesn't, you know, you can charge that person, but they're, they're not going to be locked up, especially a pregnant woman. Uh, but at the time they didn't know she was pregnant, but regardless of the fact, um, if the court's not going to do anything with it and they're not going to go to jail, I'm not going to risk my life to arrest that person. Um, the amount of effort that I'm going to put into it is going to be commemorate commensurate to the amount of effort that our society and our courts are going to put into it. So if it's a domestic violence offender, it's someone that shot at somebody, someone that threatened to shoot somebody violations of protection order, which she happened to have a warrant for, um, all of these things that could lead to a potentially dangerous situation. I'm willing to put myself in danger to affect that arrest that might actually involve standing in front of a parked car, um, with, the offender in the driver's seat. If I don't have time to move a cruiser or do other things, I might, I might do that. There are circumstances where that could be feasible. A shoplifter, no. Um, the other part is if, let's say he didn't have time to draw his firearm. Uh, she threw it in drive and hit the gas at the exact same moment, um, moved forward and struck him. Uh, he wasn't athletic enough to jump up on the hood like he did. Uh, you know, you, you get hit, you trip, you fall down. I'm not even saying that the car is going to run over you, but you might just fall down and bump your head. Uh, people have become paralyzed, permanently paralyzed for simply falling down and bumping their head. Um, not to mention that if you got hit by a car, run over by a car, your, your clothing or your web gear, your, your duty belt, your vest, something gets caught on that car and you're drugged by that car. Um, you're putting yourself in a uh, potentially very bad situation for a crime that nobody cares about, um, effectively. Of course, the retail stores care about it and the small business owners care about it, that they're, they're being robbed blind by these thieves, but our society doesn't care. The courts don't care. Um, it's not worth getting seriously injured in order to apprehend a person in that case. And now you have a situation where, um, you weren't seriously injured but you killed somebody. Um, you killed somebody that was a 21 year old black woman who also happened to be pregnant. Um, that's going to cause a lot of outrage. Uh, it's going to cause a lot of stress for yourself. You now have to go through all these court proceedings. Even if you're cleared, um, there's going to be a target on your back for the rest of your life. You will forever be known as, and, and by certain parts of the population, you will forever be known as that racist cop that killed that black pregnant girl for shoplifting. Um, that's what people are going to remember. They're not going to remember that she put the car in drive, that she actually struck you with your car. They're not going to remember any of that. They're just going to say, which I see in the comments, you know, shoplifting should not be a death sentence. That's what people are saying. You're going to be the guy that's remembered for that. Um, don't put yourself in that situation. So the other thing that I want to remind the public of when a crime happens to you and it's not a, a violent crime, it's not a serious crime, it's not the end of the world, you're going to be you're going to be able to 
go see tomorrow. And a police officer responds to that crime and you, you're all pissed off because they're not moving heaven and earth in order to solve your crime. Um, remember it's not always worth it for the police officer to put in all that effort. Um, to risk his life to go out and solve your low level misdemeanor crime because he could potentially get hurt or killed, or he could be forced to hurt and kill somebody else. And that's going to cause almost just as many problems. So tactically, not something that I would recommend people do, even though I will defend his ability to do so legally. It's not something that I would do. And I want to make sure that people understand that distinction. Um, I've been called a lot of names and had a lot of accusations thrown at me online because I'm defending this officer's actions, but I'm defending them on legal grounds, not based on what I would do or what I think is the best way to handle it. Um, we don't prosecute police officers for making tactical errors. That's not how the courts work. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the prosecution has to prove that once she put the car in drive and started to move forward, that he had the ability to move out of the way and not discharge his firearm. Um, I think that is going to be very difficult for the court to prove in this case. And I think that he will not be indicted. Those are my personal thoughts on this situation based on the amount of information I have, my training, my experience, and all that put together. Still not a situation that I want to be in, not a situation that I'm going to put myself in. I think that's it for today. Thank you for watching. I'll talk to you later.